Well, I, first of all, the fact that 140 people or more are wanting to come here about nonprofits just does my soul good. As you can see or you heard, I've lived my life in this sector, as many of you do as a volunteer, and just happen to get paid to do what I love every day. So I am thrilled to see such a great turnout and also these incredible panelists. I'm assuming you are here to hear from them and not from me. I just get to ask the questions, but um, it's a wonderful subject. I, you know, it's kind of scary, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope there isn't a lot of ugly, but um, occasionally things can go a little wry. I mean, it's a complicated sector with a lot of moving pieces and a lot of human capital involved. And um, so um, we're really looking forward. I know I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists today. There were long bios on these amazing people um, on the website, so I'm going to make it short and so you, we can get to the important questions. But I've known them all a very long time, so I'm just going to say a few remarks. First of all, AJ Griffin, she's no stranger. She's not wearing green, but she normally does. Yay. Um, she is in her third year as the Director of Government and Community Affairs for that little company off of the highway up there called Paycom, in case you've ever, you thought it was a whole other city, it's really just one company. Um, also, many of you know her as she served our state um, in a very um, tremendous way as a state senator for six years, so thank you for that service as well, AJ. She, I'm not going to give you the list of any of the boards that any of these folks sit on because we'd be here forever, but she sits on many boards and, and is a big advocate for a lot of issues and she, she is actually one of my bosses as she serves on my board. Um, Thomas Hill. Thomas, as many of you know, is the CEO of another little company off a of highway called Kim Ray. Um, I live near there, so I, get, I always, when I met Thomas, I see I've known about you for my entire life driving by. So he is the grandson of the founder of Kim Ray and has launched uh, so many efforts in mentoring, caring for people, talking about leadership, mentoring people in leadership, including his Kimmel Foundation for Recovering Leadership, and has authored a book, which many of you might know about, and also just serves on many boards, and as, again, as a mentor to many, and um, so appreciated in this industry. So thank you, Thomas. Um, yes. We're not saving the applause for them, we're doing it now. Now, Dave, Dave Lopez um, and I go back a very long time, and Dave um, served, as many of you know, most people don't know, it was called SBC, but um, is now AT&T for 22 years, and came to the Oklahoma City market, moved back down to the Oklahoma City market, and loved Oklahoma City so much that he came back with his wonderful family. He has served on both corporate boards and nonprofit boards, so I think we're gonna get some interesting um, examples from Dave, from that experience, and, um, he, it, you know, he. If you looked him up, it would say retired, but I've never seen that man slow down. So, th thank you, Dave. And uh, yes. And, and finally, um, if anybody knows anything about any nonprofit in Oklahoma City, they know Sarah Roberts. So she serves as the Vice President of Programs for the In As Much Foundation here in o Central Oklahoma. They fund and support so many efforts that I know many of you in this room are involved with. Um, Sarah is, again, on, she's not only on a, a, a many nonprofit boards, she has some appointments from the governor, serves on lots of committees. I get to work with her very often at the center. So, and all, I just, I wrote on here, she's the heart of nonprofits in Oklahoma City. City. So welcome, Sarah. So there are a lot of questions that um, we have put together for today, and I'm going to ask you all to answer the, all of you have to answer the first question, and you have to answer the last question. And the other questions in between, some of you might have, have examples or examples of things that you have from those, and some of you might not. So I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands um, on those other questions and see who wants to go first. But on the first one, I'll just start here to my right with Sarah. So I really want each of you to share one thing that's been particularly rewarding and one thing that's been particularly challenging about your tenure as a board member. Thanks so much, Marnie. It's so great to see everybody today, and there's so many friends in the audience. It's like a nonprofit reunion today, and <laughs> lots of lots of good for-profit uh, supporters in the audience too. So thank you all as well. Um, you know, I think for me and in as much foundation. Probably uh, most rewarding has been when we can build public-private partnerships. That seems to be a very sustainable model for nonprofits to flourish and continue to sustain long-term. 
Uh, in terms of challenging, and a few of you that, that I serve on boards with or have served on your board or in the audience, I think the hardest thing as a board member is just to really continue to remind yourself to stay out of the weeds and stay high level around the vision and let the CEO, executive director, handle uh, the day to day. Thanks, Sarah. Dave? Well, thanks. Uh, Marnie talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm here representing the ugly. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, as far as I take a kind of a page out of what Sarah was just saying about partnerships, I think what I've enjoyed most is when teams work together well. And so whether that's staff and uh, the governance of, with the board, customers, shareholders, communities, when those things all click, it's just such a lift. Uh, and so those are the things that both in the profit sector and nonprofit sector that I've enjoyed the most. From a standpoint of, since we're talking about dilemmas, uh, that I think uh, has been the most challenging is uh, one on a corporate side with a founder uh, when it was his turn to think about succession planning really struggled with that and the pressures that put on the board were incredible uh, to the point where it ended up that uh, as a resolution that the company was sold uh, so and it turned out well for shareholders it turned out well I think for the individual involved but it was really interesting a brilliant person had done fabulous things uh, but boy it, his identity I guess was so tied up with that title it, it really became a struggle so uh, that's a, I think the dilemma that because there's some also on the nonprofit side where you have great founders that have vision and uh, but all of us have uh, a season for leadership and uh, need to recognize at some point Thank you, Dave. That's actually called founder syndrome, so <laughs> they have a name for it, but thank you for mentioning that. All right, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Marnie, and uh, I'm just really honored to be here. I'm, I'm going to echo something that, that uh, Sarah said. I, I think, first of all, the thing that, it, that I've had the most fun and I get the most uh, enjoyment and fulfillment out of is especially working on small nonprofit boards um, that have a lot of potential for growth because a board is really the tool for growing an organization and giving them the ability to do that. And if we do our jobs well, then we can free the executive director, the CEO, and the staff to really do the work. We can, and and it, it's just wonderful watching those things take off. The, the flip side of that is when the founder, you, Sarah, you said, you know, boards need to stay high level, stay governance, stay vision. I absolutely agree with that. And likewise, um, the executive director needs to understand that that's the board's job. And if they won't relinquish any of that and, and want to be too much in control, then that creates a lot of problems for board members. Um, you never want to take the keys away from anybody. That's not any fun at all. And so the times I've had to be involved in that, I think, would be the kind of the worst things that I've had to do as a board. So. I'm going to continue the theme. You've heard a little a partnership, and um, having served in the policy arena and in the nonprofit arena now in the, the funding arena, when those three things come together and you create that synergy, um, that's really when the magic happens. And we have some amazing examples in Oklahoma of programs that are doing innovative work and creating major change that required all three to, to, to be in sync. Um, and I'm going to tell you that the, the innovation comes from the nonprofit sector in most situations. <clears throat> I'm being a little triggered being on Lincoln Avenue right now. I just got to tell you. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, but I remind people the folks that work in that building that isn't where innovation occurs generally. They're, that's not their job. They're they're to represent the people. They're reflective of what's happening in their community. So they need the help of the innovators and the creators that are in this room to, to pull them along sometimes. And on the flip side, when the exact opposite happens, um, as uh, I always called it, when we hunker down and protect our crumbs, um, that without brush away the crumbs and find a whole new cookie somewhere else, that that is something that happens, and it happens in the government space, it happens in the funder space, and it happens in the, the nonprofit space as well. And that's when I've seen things really get off the rails. That's what's usually happening. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Great examples already. So um, there are three basic legal duties: lead, care of duty of care, loyalty, and obedience. I hope most of you have heard about them, and we're going to focus a minute on the duty of loyalty to the organization. So as you, um, to you know, it's, the definition is really to pursue the organization's best interest at all times, to avoid self-dealing, and to support the organization's decisions publicly. 
So can e I'm just going to throw this one out and see who jumps at it. Can any of you share a time when you saw someone on a board violate this responsibility or maybe even come close to the edge, I might say, of violating it where it could have been a problem? And how was that handled by the board? Was it handled well? And were there lessons learned? So does someone want to jump in on duty of loyalty? Yes, sir. I've read that question and, and I'm sure that there are plenty of examples of, of actual violations of like fiduciary duty um, and those are typically easy to spot and often dealt with very quickly. There's a lot of things around that. What I don't see a lot of protection on and what I do see violated a lot in loyalty, as board members we have a part of our loyalty is a loyalty of confidentiality. So technically what happens in the boardroom should never leave the boardroom unless it is a resolution by the board, unless it is instruction that is then given to the organization or the board as a whole agrees to communicate to the outside community. I see board members all the time discussing things that should never be discussed outside the boardroom. And if I can use this analogy, it's a little like gossip by prayer, right? So they're, you know, they're like, oh, I just want to get this person's opinion or I want to do this or I want to do it. But the fact of the matter is we don't, as individual board members, have the right to take the discussions that are going on inside the board, outside the board. And the worst offense of that is when a board member has a relationship with someone in the organization, especially if it's in the management of the organization, and there are conversations going on between a board member and an individual management person that's revealing the discussions the board's having that are not, that's not, that's not right. So that would be the one that I would, I would guard against the most, and, and unless you're thinking about that, it's real easy to violate. You know, it's real easy to talk. Talking is easy, and so. I would just encourage those of you that are on boards to remember that. That is a great, great example. And I've always told people, if you tell one person, you've told 10 people, and each of those 10 people tell 10 people, and suddenly 100 people know before you, and you only thought you were telling one person. That is a really And really, bad news travels much yeah, faster than good news. Yeah, I, I know that. Um, anybody else? Yes, AJ. Well, if I use the example, it's a little bit like parenting, where you, you praise publicly, and you correct privately. Mm -hmm. um, Good. Yes. And that just kind of reflects a little bit of what Thomas said. Okay. Absolutely. Any other, any other things about duty of loyalty? I, I love the examples that have already been given. You know, I think what comes to mind for me, thankfully, is not true violations, but just things that can get real close. You know, nonprofits, as a rule, are looking for lawyers and accountants and construction managers and architects to serve on their boards to provide their professional expertise to that nonprofit. And I think when nonprofits decide to say, you know, build a building or decide that they need some legal representation for whatever reason, often those people are the first ones in a, in a very positive way to raise their hands and say, oh, I think I can help or my firm could do this. And they may even offer for a discounted rate or maybe even something pro bono. I think the best boards I've been on do a good job reminding that individual, like, thank you so much. That is so appreciated. We do need to probably have some sort of request for proposals. We may need you to recuse yourself from a vote. We may even need you to resign from a board. I think thinking through those things at the board level when those sort of conflicts arise, which, which happens at almost every nonprofit, is really important. Dave, I'm going to ask you one specifically, if that's all right. And did you have one for that? Do you want no, no. Yeah, okay. Well, and this one, and because uh, when I look at at, um, at Dave's resume of how many boards you've served on, and there, you know, there's the real obvious conflicts like I'm your banker, I'm your contractor, I'm, you know, my husband works for this person or whatever. But there's also when you serve on multiple boards at the same time. Um, and which I bet you've done. Uh, can you think of some, any examples of like being conflicted around something at the, you know, when, just the kind of the soft things? You know, uh, there are some times when it comes up that I think the primary duty we have, and you're right, it's almost invariable that it's going to come up sooner or later. And that's just disclosure to your fellow board members saying, hey, here's something you should know. I also serve on that board, or my wife's on that board, and we've talked about this. Just know that, you know, check me on that. And so just to be open, but I think just getting the word out there, I think it has an effect on everybody kind of just bringing their shoulders down. Because they're probably aware, too, that it may be a conflict. 
And so it's, it's a good way to withdraw. And so we can be thoughtful that way. Uh, and then the other thing that I found useful uh, for me, it, it's something my wife echoes to me often, is, is reminding us, what's your motivation? Why are you in with that organization? And why is this an issue right now? And so that really helps because often it'll be, you know, a sin of pride. Well, I just want to kind of control this, you know, that kind of. So it may seem innocuous, but those are the kinds of things that are imbalances. One thing that I also have found that works really well on the, and I haven't seen it as much on the nonprofit side, but when it's uh, when I've had the uh, blessing of working with companies that have a corporate governance committee, so it's like who watches the watchers. Uh, as was said here, I think the best way I've heard it expressed is those of us on the board should keep our noses in and our fingers out. And I think that describes it, but having an, your colleagues around the table, just an annual review, uh, it's programmed, and so it's not the matter of, oh, what did you just do? It's just we're gonna review this annually and be able to talk to each other. Sometimes having the data collected by independent third party and then shared with the board, it's just a good way to uh, start the year with a clear feeling about everybody being engaged for the right purpose and uh, unified as we go forward. So. Those board governance committees are really key. They're also often, the one I'm most familiar with, uh, helps with uh, recruiting fellow board members. And so that way you're not ahead of the CEO, you're not responding to the CEO on who a new board member should be. Uh, it's part of what the board's function should be. So anyway, that's just a, something I found works that's very well. That's a elegant. great, that question is why am, I, why am I saying yes to this in the first place? What's my motivation? Really good. Uh, uh, any, any of you who've served on multiple boards, thoughts that go through your head, self-talk. Anybody? Okay. Get on it. Okay. Okay. No, well, I, I'll mention. Go ahead. Well, I just think you know leaders are notorious for over committing um, because we are good at what we do, and we wouldn't be in our positions if we didn't. And I know a lot of people who uh, I've served on boards with, they're overcommitted, and they're not actually functioning as board members. They are filling a chair, they come to meetings, they're not fully prepared, they don't keep up, um, and they just you know, raise their hand, and that's not really being a board member. If you're gonna be a board member on a nonprofit, you need to be invested in that, you need to spend time outside the board meeting, being prepared, knowing what's going on, doing the work, being on committees, you can't do that on 20 boards. Nobody can have a full-time job and do that on 20 boards. So um, I think we need to be realistic and say, let's spread it around. Let some of these young people do it for a while. Great, great point. Well, as was stated in my bio, I have served on 30, and so I'm a serial board member. But I will tell you, it, it was very problematic. If, if, if you're thinking of talking to a donor, you know, well, I know AJ, and she's at Paycom, and she has money, and I'm on, I'm on you know, this board, and I think, but really, that other board I'm on really needs her money more, so I'm not gonna tell them I know AJ, so I'm literally having a conversation within myself about how I'm gonna use my sphere of influence for that organization when you're right. If I wasn't on many at the same time, that wouldn't happen, so. Um, uh, anyway, I'm not on the panel, but I do have some examples. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. Um, the next question. Um, this is a. This is kind of about the power thing. On a board, there are many times when one member has more power or influence over another, and all boards have certain power and influence over the paid staff. Um, you know, the rule is the board hires, fires, and you know, they they really only control the CEO or executive director, and then all. You know, ideally, the CEO then you know, is all the, all the, manages all the people under them. Can you think of a time when you saw power or privilege misused by some, one of these people who had really power and influence, and how could a board better avoid those situations? I think for that question, what comes to mind is the example that Thomas gave earlier about being real careful about what you disclose outside of the boardroom and um, you know the other reminder that I'm constantly telling myself internally is you only have power as a board member when you're with the collective body you don't have power when you're individually on your own or even in a small group of board members it's only the collective board that has power and I think reminding yourself of that as a board member but also having a CEO who's empowered to remind the board of that when needed is really important. 
Marnie, I've got an example too as, um, well, I got a lot of examples of that one. <laughs> but the one that comes to mind is when a donor claims a board member, that's my board member. Uh, and that happens fairly frequently, and especially sometimes when you have those of us that are the appointed board member on a particular board because there's a certain donor that I know fairly well who gives away a lot of money. Um, and that can be a real problem, so it's very important for the training, plug for standards, of train, <laughs> standards of excellence, for the training to occur so that that person identifies that you're not representing that particular donor on this board, you're a member of the collective. And that, that word, you, the power that Sarah just says lies in the collective and, and the decision making that occurs through the democratic process on a board is very important. Yeah, I would, that's what I would have said, first of all, is that you have no power as an individual board member. So if you're doing things, you're acting unethically in that regard. But you do have influence, and you do have sometimes privilege, and that's the hardest thing not to use inappropriately, is if you are, like you said, if you're holding the purse strings of somebody that's important, then people are going to listen to you differently than they might listen to someone else. If you're best friends, with the executive director, then you may be able to have them do certain things or, or move the, the organization in a direction without going through the board. Um, and I think that that's something that the rest of the board needs to be aware of. Um, and I love that you mentioned training because most of us, if you've served on a nonprofit board, I would bet you at dinner you probably didn't get trained um, by them or by anybody else. And I don't understand why that's true. I don't understand why we don't train our board members, and it's mostly because we don't understand what they're supposed to be doing. So I would, I'm going to way second that. We need more training for board members and organizations. <laughs> One thing I might add from a different perspective is the, uh, uh, the role of staff on some of this in the sense that one of the things that I think is a danger, particularly for nonprofits, are single year terms for some board members or for a chair. Because I've <laughs> been on the staff of one nonprofit that the discussion came up about, okay, here's where the board wants to go and they're on fire after the retreat and here's the three objects we've got to get after. And the staff reaction was, and I wasn't the leader of this organization, but just a member of the staff was, we can wait that out. <laughs> and you go, oh, <laughs> it's one of those, okay, did not distract. But I mentioned that because it, when you think about when you accept a board term, two years I think makes a lot of sense. It gives, the first three months are getting oriented, the next six are trying to really get your feet in there. And if it's just a single year, you're saying goodbye about the time you actually are able to have value to the organization. So, anyway, small. Okay, that's, that's, that's funny. You can wait that out. That's, if you didn't hear him, he said they can, if you have a strategic plan and the, and the staff doesn't like it, they're like, he'll be gone in a year, we really don't have to do that. We'll slow down that process. Or any, any other things about power? I will, one thing, you know, the amount of money people contribute to an organization can make the, uh, uh, the playing field uneven. So one good practice is just to redact that. In all the documents you share with the board, don't share with the board that you know, Dave gave this or Sarah gave that because suddenly you're like, oh, that's the guy at the end. He just gave us a million dollars. I disagree with his opinion, but I'm not going to say anything because he's not going to, you know, he just gave us a million dollars. He's got a bigger voice than I do. So I've never been the biggest donor in, on a board I've sat on, but, you know, you just want to have an equal voice, which I think was a bit spoken to. So we're going to move to the uh, to the subject about management versus governance and so um, we've this uh, this last question kind of had a little bit to do with that but can you think of a, a time when you think the board um yeah and it can go both ways the board can move into trying to manage the organization other than manage the executive director or are there times you've even seen you know an executive director try to manage and, or govern the board. So any examples of that? I feel like I've seen both of those things, honestly. Um, from a board perspective, I think really planning mm -hmm. out your term limits with some thoughtfulness makes a lot of sense. You don't want all of your 
historical knowledge to roll off the board at the same time. Otherwise, your CEO or your executive director is almost going to be forced to kind of jump into that board role and cross some lines just to lead the board appropriately going forward. So really balance new newer board members and older board members rolling off simultaneously as much as you can. And then I think from the nonprofit perspective, and, and all of us in this room who've served on boards have seen this many times, when you have an unexpected departure of an executive director or a CEO, often the board has to step into that role temporarily. But I think really asking yourself, okay, what hat do I have on in this moment until we get the new CEO ED? And then when do I take that hat back and get back into that strict governance of kind of vision and hiring and firing the CEO? Because often some board members, especially at smaller nonprofits, do have to step in temporarily when there's an absence of day-to-day -day leadership. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Sarah. Um, and I, just a plug, I, my preference is three classes with three-year terms. Mm -hmm. and, and one class rolls off or has to get elected every year. So you have continuity. Three years, I think, mm -hmm. is not too long, right. but it's certainly not a year. So you know, there are a lot of variants there. Big plug here for governance, some sort of governance, a formal governance. My preference is policy governance. It's a, it's a formal governance plan, but there are a lot of different ones out there. But, but you have to have clear delineation between what is the board's responsibility and what is the management's responsibility. It's already been said that the board should have a single employee, so we should have one person that we're giving direction to. That direction should always be by board vote, so it's the whole board says this is what you do. And that governance document is really the largest amount of that communication. It's this is what we want you to accomplish. These are the things you're to do. These are the things that you have to bring back to us. These are the things you can't do. Um, I'm governed by a board in, in a for-profit world where all of us that are CEOs uh, have a board. My board has very clear limits on what I'm allowed to do without their permission, how much money I can spend before I have to go to them, the kinds of things that I can do, and very clear delineation of what I'm supposed to accomplish. That's what I see missing most of the time, and most of the boards that I've um, had problems on, that was what was missing, was that clear delineation and that governance. So um, if you're a board member and your nonprofit, the board you're on, doesn't have a governance policy, that might be the thing that you could do for that organization, is to help them implement. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. And then all the board members who come after you, they'll have a lane to run in. And then you can, then you can get on with doing what the nonprofit's supposed to be doing, instead of constantly be going, well, are we supposed to be deciding this? Is the, CEO is supposed to decide this, and the CEO is coming to you. I'm not sure if I need your all's approval. I got this going on. So, Great. Marnie, I'm going to add to that. If it's a nonprofit that has a, a government contract, that complexity complexity gets even more complicated. And the things that those contracts require, who signs for what? Is it the board chair? Is it the executive director? Um, so it can be really important to review that based on those funding sources. Uh, and the complexity of state contracts adds, um, adds a certain level of expertise that the board members need because in that situation, board meetings aren't confidential. They're required to be open meetings. Right. And so if you have those contracts, you've really got to be careful in who you select to serve on your board and you really need, need some board members that know what they're doing. Any, any other examples? Oh. Okay, that, but that is a line that gets crossed, and oftentimes people ask me, you know, what, what, you know, all that executive director left. The the main reason an executive director leaves an organization is they get crosswise with the, with the board. I mean, that's really what unfortunately happens, and those clear lines really protect both sides. So. Um, okay, what about a donor? We've talked about board members kind of coming in and trying to manage an organization. Uh, AJ spoke a little bit about donor. What about, do you have an example of when a donor maybe came in and tried to manage as, an organization? Or even not over, not, you know, totally manage, but get, get in that lane. Any thoughts? I think from a donor perspective at Inasmuch Foundation, I mean, the examples that I think of is there's been times, and, and most philanthropies here locally have had this happen, where maybe you're, you're doing some founding of an organization or you're kind of driving getting an organization started. You know, I think there could be a potential amount of ownership that needs to be temporary in nature. And so figuring out, okay, how long are we going to kind of 
own this in terms of funding the majority of the budget and when do we need to take a step back and Marnie can speak beautifully on some of the regulations around that level of ownership from a donor perspective but I think also what I do frequently at Inasmuch Foundation is just ask myself does this decision that this nonprofit is getting ready to make directly affect Inasmuch Foundation funding that answer is almost always no. So I should not be using my funding hat, quote unquote, the majority of the time with that organization. I should be using my board hat and I should be real clear when I'm talking to other board members and to the executive director CEO, which hat I'm coming from in any given time. You know, one thing that, that I think works well is to have clarity uh, up front. I mean, all of us at our nonprofits, when that big check comes in, it's like, oh, cash it, let's get after it, let's do whatever the key project is in the moment. But really to have that, that uh, clear agreement with the donor about uh, what that's going to, how exactly uh, you'll have accountability, uh, but not management of those money, those funds. Not, and that, that is tough because uh, there have been just one or two instances I can recall where a donor suggests that, well, now that you're into construction, Here's who handles our construction. And man, that's a, that's a tough deal. Uh, so as much as you can do that up front, I think everybody knows going in what the deal is and, and hopefully it, it works happily for both. I agree. Donors can be the main source of mission creep as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this, so the question as board members, are we doing this because it's our mission or are we doing it because someone's willing to pay for it? <laughs> right, good, good question. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so um, board members um, have, as we've talked about, clarity, upfront expectations, and many, and hopefully all of the boards you serve on have some kind of form that outlines what your responsibilities or commitments are. Have you ever been on a board where a board member was not living up to those commitments, and do you, any examples of how that was handled? Yes, <laughs> and this, was on, this is on the corporate. Nobody wants to and, say by, yes. and by the way, we, we all said we're not going to say any of the names of any of the organizations. Yeah, to, to that point, the yeah, this was an out of state organization. <laughs> uh, but it, it was uh, a tough moment from, from the standpoint of being able to, again, get back to what's the motivation and to ask ourselves that question. But in this particular instance, it was one where the board was aware and, and we needed to correct it. Really, the only thing was, can we wait till we do the board evaluations in the fall? Uh, and what was really useful in that, again, that's why I endorsed the Board of Governors Committee, because it wasn't me saying, hey, Phil, really, let's get real here. This is, it was the board saying, guess what? It, it may be time to, to, to move on. In this particular case, I think that the factor was uh, more age-related, sadly. Uh, loss of filters and uh, berating of staff, uh, things that, that may come naturally to those of us hit a certain point, but it becomes an ethical dilemma. It's one I'm struggling with right now to say, okay, you mentioned sphere of influence. My sphere of influence is getting smaller as the years go by. I had a good instance in a fundraising deal a couple of months ago. It was hard to get a call returned. And I thought, wow, well, this hasn't happened. <laughs> well, I gotta be honest with myself. Hey, if, if what's important is to have that sphere of influence, mine's diminishing. I've got to then recognize that and say, when's the time to retire from those boards? But again, those board governances, it takes the, it's still painful, but it takes the personal confrontation out. Amen, Dave. I, why is it that our sphere of influence gets smaller, but our sphere gets bigger? I don't know. <laughs> How that works. Says the guy who didn't eat lunch. Uh, <laughs> you know, a chairman of the chairman of a board has really has no power other than than being a board member. They have one vote, but they do have responsibilities in addition to that that are different than the rest of the board members. And that's the respon that, that I think that's the responsibility of the chairman. So when you have a board member that is not performing, 
Um, the first line, I think, is that should be something that the chairman goes to that board member and, and attempts to deal with. Unfortunately, that's uncomfortable, it's difficult, but come on, leadership is not easy. It's not always fun, it's not always glamorous. In fact, most of the time, it's a mess, and that's what we signed up for. And so, if you do get to be a chairman of the board, that's your job. Your job is to make sure that board functions. I, of course, won't name the board that I was on, but I was on a board where, um, in order to receive grant money, which was necessary for this organization, all the board had to participate financially. And there were board members sitting in the room during a board meeting that had not contributed. And I just, and I wasn't the chairman. If I was, I would have really, but I just stood up in the meeting so I, and said, you gotta be kidding me. You know, you all, and, I, and you're in a board meeting and it wasn't a deal where we had to be public meetings. So I pointed people out. I said, you know, what are you doing here if you're not gonna, you know, if you're not gonna do the, do the job? So maybe you're that board member that says, but I think we're back to, if we all understand what we're supposed to be doing, then it's all of our responsibility to make sure it's getting done. We're not just sitting there warming a seat. And if something's not being dealt with, you have a responsibility as a board member to raise your hand and say, why isn't this happening the way it should? It's just the job. Yep, yep. And it's a hard job. And when you yeah. accept that job, you expect, accept that responsibility. So very important. I, I can think of a couple of concrete examples here that, that have impressed me through the years. One, and many of us who were on this board are in the room today, we had a situation where there was not 100% board giving. And, and I'll never forget it. The board chair said, uh, guys, I need everybody to open up their purses and their wallets and pull out five, ten, twenty dollars, we're going to make sure we get to 100% giving right now. And literally, I mean, people just pulled out cash and many of us had already given, but we were like, of course, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was awkward, but in a beautiful way. And then the other one I can think of, and this again is a local board, and I think this is very impressive. They have a very strict attendance policy. And if you do not attend a certain percentage of board me meetings, you are voted off automatically and you have to be, you have to ask to be voted back on. Well, you can be darn sure I was going to make sure I made it to those board meetings. And I, I always thought that was really impressive how absolutely serious they took board attendance. Yeah. Well, like you said, you, you're, you're in those seats for a reason and those are important seats to be in. So. Well, we had another question, which mirrors a question, and thank you all for these great questions from the audience. And what can other board members do when there is obvious tension between a board member and an executive director? Because we're all human and we all have personalities. So can you think of ways, uh, things that have happened or ways other board members might intervene to take away some of the tension? So Marnie, I'll start. I, I sit on one of the boards that I, I still sit on. The executive director has actually moved on and was brought on specifically to address this situation. And I see people nodding their heads. Some of you have been asked to do this. This reason I was in the room because we had this conflict and started by I'm going to get to the bottom of it and find out what's, is it a personality conflict? In this particular case, we had a ethical dilemma and the person on the board was in the right. Once I did all of the due diligence, looked at all of the numbers, invest, you know, talked to other folks, listened to the stories, and so the appropriate resolution was that we needed a change in leadership and it was based on an ethical issue with um, some funds, as a matter of fact. Um, and, but board members can play a very important role, and especially someone who is a fresh face. Mm -hmm. And I started from zero. I didn't know either either of these people that I was involved in. So that can be a very important role. And But you start with, I need to understand the story, and I need to look at the evidence. Um, that's why record keeping, or, or the lack of record keeping, which was the problem in this <laughs> particular case, can kind of speak for itself. What does the paper say? And then I'm going to base it not on your personality, not on whether I like you or not, but what is it that the paper is telling me has occurred? 
Well, and I think just kind of adding on to what AJ just said, a lot of nonprofit boards don't have robust executive committees that are meeting on a regular basis, which is a great place to flush any issues that the board is having out. In addition, calling an executive session every couple of board meetings is a great practice, but you rarely see it at a nonprofit board level unless there's an issue with performance of the CEO or the executive director. We shouldn't wait to call executive sessions until there's something negative going on. We should be calling for them in a proactive way so that board members can communicate with one another about positive things before things do go negative. To that point, there was a, a lesson I'll share from a uh, board chair that had a, every other board meeting would have an executive session. And so once management is excused, we'd sit there and say, guys, gals, have anything to talk about? And Nine times out of ten, we wouldn't. But she took care to say, we're going to talk about the weather for five minutes because there's going to be a time we're going to need to talk, <laughs> and let's not have them expect that we're just going to bang the gavel after 30 seconds. So let's talk for a while. So that kept, it seemed like the length of that uh, kept everybody on their toes, and, and, and darn if we didn't make it easier to bring up things that weren't crises yet, but just concerns. And so uh, those executive sessions just scheduled, not that, oh my gosh, we've never had an executive session before from this board, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. That's scary. That's the thing that scares the CEO. They're like, oh my gosh, I've done something wrong. But if they're regularly scheduled on, on their, oh, oh, I've got, I guess. Yep. Got it. Um, you know, I was on a board once and they had an executive session where the uh, CEO stayed in. And we called it the what keeps the CEO awake at night session. So yeah. she could talk to the board about what kind of is keeping her awake at night without her team in there. And then she left and we called that what keeps the board awake at night. <laughs> and, they, and they could talk about what, you know, without her in the room. So just that, I tr I'm hearing transparency, I'm Absolutely. hearing open communication. So, Marnie, um, what yes. you just said I think is really important and, and maybe say it a different way. And that is that um, oftentimes as boards we wait for the executive director or the CEO to bring us information. We expect them to bring us stuff. We often aren't asking them non-metric questions like, what's keeping you awake at night? What, you know, what, is, what, is, what, are, what are your problems? What are you worried about? What do you sense is a, you know, giving them the freedom to say that. So I think that's beautiful. I, I think you should write a book and the title could be, I was on a board once. <laughs> Because that has to be the beginning of a thousand stories. I've got a lot, and some of the people in this room, I have, we've shared them, some of those stories, so um, I do. So this is a really different question. I'm gonna, it came in last, but I'm gonna ask it right now. What can young professionals, how can they get involved with boards, especially if they don't have the funds to contribute, or they might not feel like they're at the same level as some of the people like you who serve on a board. Have you seen times, you know, there are young professional boards where they set them in their, they're an advisory board board or a teen board or a middle school board, but have you ever seen a time when that you've brought someone, a young professional, on the governing board? And how's that helped? I, I love that this question is being repeated by Marnie Taylor because you're looking at someone who absolutely nourishes young professionals in our community and often is pointing out you know, hey Sarah, hey Dave, hey Thomas, hey AJ, have you met so-and-so, they're going to be a great board member, or have you met so-and-so, they're an amazing candidate for an executive director CEO role. And so I think just keeping your eyes out for those young professionals and then saying to them, frankly, hey, are you, would you ever be interested in serving on a board? If so, I as a more seasoned professional will vouch for you and will help you get onto a board. And I think sometimes young professionals are just looking for someone to reach out. I will say, I see Jenny in the audience, I mean, Marnie's here, they reached out to me as a young professional and said, let us help connect you. And so that's something that I think this entire panel loves and enjoys. So if that's something you're excited about or someone listening is excited about, just reach out. We will connect you. Nonprofits need board members desperately. And, and anyone who wants to get involved, there is a role for you. Amen. I, I would say, and I think it's already been said once, but you need to find something that you're passionate about because if you're just looking to create a list of things that you've been on, then I, I'm not sure I want to be on a board with you. I want to be on a board with you if the organization we're serving is something that you're passionate about. So look around the city, find something that, that you're passionate about, something that is being taken care of or solved or dealt with or enhanced by, by a group, 
and quite frankly just call them and say, hey, I'm a young professional, I'm interested in your organization, get to know the organization. I imagine about 70% of the time you'd probably end up on the board just doing that. You don't even need another person to, because they are all looking for, there's never enough people to do the work that's necessary and so it should not be that complicated. Two, two quick things to share. One is United Way has a board development uh, mm -hmm. for young professionals and it's great because you, I think what I've assessed from that is, yeah, there's some new board people created. There's some that are saying, not now, not in my station of life, because I would learn how much is involved. I don't have that kind of time right now. So that's good both ways. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that boards that you already sit on, uh, once you get a new person on, young, whatever, make sure the onboarding's there, that there's a, a mentor board member that you can ask the goofy questions to, that whatever it might be, just that that person doesn't feel isolated or like they've got to gain some traction and some credibility before they're able to contribute. So uh, I think it's important not only to refresh, but also to be very welcoming to the new folks coming in. I'm gonna put on the corporate hat for those bosses in the room and someone who works with 5,000 30 year olds. Um, <laughs> Literally, they are so young. Um, it, it is also the responsibility of employers uh -huh. and other leaders that are in positions where they get to lead work and go do their board stuff to nurture that with young professionals as well. Amen. And do it for the right purpose, like you said, passion. Do it to, for, for the civic engagement, the community pride that develops. But you'll find that God blesses you with opportunities. Mm -hmm. You'll be sitting next to somebody you learn from, that from a business standpoint. Uh, I can think of three different corporate boards that I've served on that I first made the acquaintance serving on a community board. Mm -hmm. So it's not why you do it, uh, but again, I don't know how uh, God works a lot of times. <laughs> but it's amazing that if you go in for the right purpose uh, that you're going to be uh, brought into a network with people that uh, may not think like you, but that provide opportunities for you. Amen. That's great. Um, how does, this is an audience question, how does a board member deal with a former board member, this is interesting, who no longer is on the board, but who is violating the duty of care, loyalty, confidentiality, obedience? Kind of it, we, none of us are lawyers, right? No, <laughs> there's a couple in the room, but that's an interesting question. Or have you ever seen that happen, a former board member get involved? I definitely have seen that happen and you know I'm not going to be the one that's going to give you the legal answer there are other people with that expertise that can give you that but I think what I would urge you just back to Dave's point about putting ego aside and and really being in this work for the right reasons which should never be personal gain of any kind you know I would just say ask yourself um, and 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 ask that potential person to really think about their love for the nonprofit organization because I find as people come and go on and off of boards and on and off of nonprofit staffs usually their personal reputations don't suffer as much as the organization's reputation so anything that you're saying negative about a person who works at a nonprofit or about a nonprofit organization itself typically hurts the organization more than it does any individual which is usually not anyone's motivation and so I think just reminding people gosh you know their reputation is so much of their credibility in Oklahoma City around the important work that they do let's make sure that we are upholding confidentiality to Thomas's earlier point and also just making sure that we are allowing that organization to put their best foot forward. I don't know if the rest of y'all picked up on that, but what you should do is call Sarah and have her go talk to the board member. Because <laughs> the way she just did that, I think I'm just going to call her. So. Hey, just a quick idea from the corporate side. You know, you leave a board, you leave a company, you sign an NDA. Yeah. I wonder if that's not something to think about. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, and also document destruction. I mean, that you, uh, I have on a board that you sign that when you leave all of the documents you receive, so donor list, anything, that you, you will destroy those documents when you're no longer on the board. So it's kind of some of the, some of the corporate practices I think would probably be, that are not used in nonprofit boards could be very useful. Um, we, ha we have about 10 more minutes. I have, I'm going to do one, maybe one or two of these quickly. What would you do if you were serving on the board and the DED asks you for help? This has never happened. The ED asks you for help, and then they don't do what you told them to do. 
I'll, I'll answer that one. I do the exact same thing I do when one of my six children comes to me and asks me for advice or help and then doesn't do what I, you know. You, again, as an individual board member, you do not have control over uh, the executive director or the CEO of a nonprofit organization or, quite frankly, even a for-profit corporation. And so um, you're, you can help. You can give advice. You can go out and have coffee and just talk through things. But we have to remember which hat we have on. And that point, your hat is you're somebody who has experience. You may be able to help. You may be able to give advice. But that's all you're doing. You can't direct them. And they don't have to do what you individually say. Now, I think the real dilemma is now you know something that might be going on. And do you have a responsibility to let the rest of the board know that there's a situation or an issue or something that's not being dealt with so that the board can act on it? And that's going to be something that you're just going to have to search your own heart. Um, obviously, if it's an ethical issue, then you have, a, uh, you have a fiduciary and an ethical responsibility. If it's just, hey, I don't know whether I should handle this this way or that way, come on, we're all adults. Just get used to it. People are going to ask you for advice and not take it. That happens to me about <laughs> every day. Um, and most of them are my family members. So, <laughs> so They know something the rest of you all don't know, apparently. Um. Another question, uh, and there is a legal there is a legal question in here about liability with TANF and ARPA funds, and I don't really think that our panel would necessarily have the answer to that. But if somebody wants, I see a couple attorneys in the room. If you want to, I'll help you with this question afterwards. So, um, what suggestions do you have for exiting board service without leaving that organization in a lurch? Or have you seen Ooh, someone? I, do I, that? I love this one just because I do have a an actual example I think I can use names with, finally. Um, you know, we at Inasmuch Foundation have been very passionate about so many organizations locally, but one uh, that's been very close to many of these panelists' heart has been Remerge, which was formed back in 2011. And I will say, um, Tyler Tokarczyk on our Inasmuch staff now serves as a board member of Remerge, but I was a founding board member. And so I think really, um, for me, there, there was great joy in seeing someone else from our organization go and fall in love with that nonprofit's mission, but also having some real hard conversations with Tyler of, you know, you're the board member now. You don't, you don't need to come get my opinion on what happens. It really wouldn't even be appropriate. And he's a young professional who's still finding his way. And honestly, he's a much better board member than I ever was. I mean, he's incredible and, and does a great job and looks at things through a lens that's different from mine. And so I think what I would urge everyone in the audience is if you're serving on a nonprofit board that you love, the best thing you can do is go find a colleague or another peer to replace you when you term off because that's what keeps that organization churning and, and continuing to do good work into the future. I mean, I would say, you know, and, and I don't know what, where the genesis of the question was, but let's say you're in a situation where something has happened in your life and, and you just simply have to exit. Well, a board, being a board member is a job. In a nonprofit world, it's not a paid job, but it's still a job. You've accepted responsibility just like you accepted responsibility when you went to work for whoever you're currently working for. And just like you wouldn't show, you would not not show up on Monday morning and never call them and tell them what was going on. You know, if you're in the middle of a project or you're in the middle of where you're going, you, if you're an ethical person, you're going to say, okay, I need to exit. So what do you need me to do to make sure that we can transfer what I'm doing to someone else? I can transfer the information. I'm, that's what you have to do. It's no different than quitting a real job. You, you have to make an orderly exit so that you don't leave the other people holding a bag that they're not prepared to, to hold. And, and I would do it the exact same way. I would just think through those things and, and do them. Great. Um, I, and uh, this one, I think we, let's do this in real quick order. What would you give, what advice would you give a new board member? What's the most important thing they can learn or do quickly when they join a board? Just c quick answers. My quick answer would be, be willing to take some time and just listen and observe before you try to take any, any major leadership uh, role. Just what you said, uh, it's said a little differently in a dicho in Spanish that, that says basically, God gave us one mouth and two ears for a reason. Yeah, I would agree with that, but, but some of the things that you need to hear, you won't hear unless you ask questions. So I would say, don't be ashamed. And somebody mentioned it before about, 
you know, being worried that maybe you don't understand what's going on. I, I get news for any of you young people, those of us who are a little older, um, and we were talking about this at the table um, before we came up here, that all of us sometimes find ourselves in rooms full of people and we look around and think, I don't belong here. I'm not old enough. I don't have experience. And quite frankly, I'm one of the oldest people in the room right now. So I don't know why I still think that. We all feel that way. So just get over that. Uh, relax and just raise your hand and say, okay, I don't understand what's going on here. I don't understand this process. I don't understand where this started. Can somebody give me some background? Um, because a lot of organizations don't have good onboarding. They're not going to give you that automatically. So just ask, ask questions. Okay. I'm going to say, read the board book. Amen. If there is one, <laughs> yeah, if there the, is one. The doc, if it exists, the documents are important yeah. because long after we leave board service, the documents remained and that's it. The documents can tell the story. Great. Now, and this is the final question that the, um, you know, they gave me to ask, and it mirrors that a little bit, but maybe to, I'm going to take a twist. What personal attributes do you think are most important that make a great board member? This is, this is probably not an attribute, and it's more of an attitude, but someone who assumes good intentions. Mm. Uh, what I'd say is, is to be a role player. I mean, I think of this as a team, and, and not everybody's going to be the center, not everybody's going to be the point guard on the team. Uh, and that's one where I think diversity is particularly important. And so uh, it's for some of us, our minorities, it sometimes feels very uncomfortable if we're the only minority in the room, and somebody says, well, what do you guys think? You're the minority. And you're kind of like, oof, okay, let me think about that. And so that part, you know, a lot of, again, corporate boards do a, uh, continuum of, okay, this person's great in IT, this one's got marketing background, this one's, the same sort of profile should happen for age, gender, you know, everything else that, that we have tensions about. Passion. Passion, that's it. Passion. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Passion for the mission. Well, and I'd say how the mission fits into the, the entire landscape. Um, when you have a non two nonprofits that do the same kind of work that create a rivalry, I'm like, Trust me, there's plenty to go around that isn't necessary. So how does what you're trying to accomplish fit into the bigger picture? And how does it complement the work of others? Amen. Well, uh, this has been fantastic. I hope you all have enjoyed it as much as I have. I mean, the knowledge, the wisdom um, has been incredible. I can't thank you enough, Sarah, Dave, Thomas, AJ, all wonderful friends of mine. And I so appreciate everything you shared. And I'm sure they'll be happy to answer some questions afterwards. But thank you so much for having all of us.